Thanks for downloading Grilled by The Stuff Canteen. I'm Cara, editor of The Stuff Canteen, and in this episode, Deputy Editor Tani talks to George Ferrugia. George is the head chef at the 2 AA Rosette Fenchurch restaurant at the top of London's Walkie Talkie building. The Mancunian chef got a university degree in law before shifting his gaze to the kitchen. He learnt to cook with some of the best French chefs around, first with Pierre Kaufman at Kaufman's, then with Eric Chaveau at Brasserie Chaveau before becoming the head chef at Bob Bob Ricard. For this podcast, we spoke to George about how he caters for the eclectic clientele at French Church and how his Cypriot roots, classical French training and love for hunting have helped define his style in the kitchen. Hi everyone, we are here today with George Ferrugia at the Sky Garden. Uh, in fact, we're at the 20 Fenchurch Street, which is otherwise known as the Walkie Talkie Building in Fenchurch Restaurant. Hi, George. How are you? Hello. How are you doing? You all right? Yeah, not too bad. Thank you. So for those of our audience that don't know you, I think what would be great to start with was, would be for you to tell us a little bit about yourself, um, how you came to be a chef, and then we can go from there. Brilliant. So, yeah, I mean, um, well, I never actually started as a chef I was uh, brought up in Manchester yeah. hence the accent just about you know, I'm <laughs> trying to lose it um, and I studied law uh, in Liverpool and um, yeah actually graduated got a law degree came wow. back to Manchester and then decided to go into cooking um, and then never looked back really um, so I had a chance to um, come and work with Pierre Kaufman so I came to London and uh, I worked with him for about eight months um, and then after that, I opened a lovely little place called the Great British, um, really, you know, seasonal um, British produce, small menu, blackboard menu, changing quite frequently, small team, but the food was fantastic and uh, we had a lot of fun. Brilliant. And then I met lovely Eric Chaveau. Um, yeah. And then, you know, that's basically the same time I met my wife. So two French people for that bow and get one free. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I met uh, Eric Chaveau at the Brasserie and um, stayed with him for three years. Yeah. So really developed my style um, with him and it was, um, you know, all about flavour really. You know, super, super tasty, tasty, tasty. Uh, zero tolerance on that as well. <laughs> it had to be good. Um, and then after that, I went and worked at the Chelsea Arts Club. Mm-hmm. A little, little stint at a private members club, operating two little restaurants there. Um, one British pub offering, the other one more uh, restaurant. Uh, really good fun. Uh, kept the same team for a couple of years, which was really great. Um, and then after that, I went a bit left wing and went and did Bob Bob Ricard, yeah. uh, which was a beast um, for a year. And then I kind of wound up in 37 floors up. Yes, yeah, the heights, <laughs> and I don't know where I'm here. Uh, but a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's brilliant to be here. Well, just tracing back to the, to the very beginning, so you worked... For Pierre Kaufman, was that your first job in a kitchen? No, it wasn't my first job. My first, my first job was in Manchester. Um, we won two rosettes, a uh, little British produce restaurant, French twists, uh, a lot of stuff, or twists at the time anyway. Um, mm-hmm. Really cool. But then, yeah, when I came to work with Pierre Kaufman, yeah, it was a bigger uh, shock to the system. Yeah, I bet. Sh- what was straight. it like working in a kitchen like that, like moving f- to London to a, like oh, such a high calibre kitchen? I mean, it was crazy. It was... Um, you know, coming from Manchester, you see one thing and then you come in and it's like, oh, okay. You know? <laughs> um, it was it was good. It was, um, I think it was a nice kick up the um, backside that I needed, really. Um, and I kind of, yeah, it's, yeah, I think it had to happen sooner or later and it was good that it happened with him. At least I got to see his kitchen, see how he operates. Um, you know, it really is a legend, you know. Yeah. Yeah, amazing food. Yeah. And then moving on to Eric Chavo, so you worked at um, Brasserie Chavo yeah. when when it got a Michelin star, right? Yeah. What was that like? Oh, it was amazing. Well, it was like um, I mean, you know, Chavo will tell you himself. It was like uh, Christmas every day, like literally, we were packed for lunch, packed for dinner oh. every day. So you know, one hundred twenty lunch, one hundred twenty dinner, nonstop for about a year and a half. When people say Christmas every day, that's not what you have in mind. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, presents every day, <laughs> turkey, no sprouts every day. No, no, no. No, no, but it was um, it was really good fun. I mean, uh, I learned a lot, um, and I think very much my style now is still quite. I mean, my family's from Cyprus, yeah. So I still have that little Mediterranean touch. I love olive oil, yeah. So does he. So it was lovely to see that. And uh, what I kind of got was the south of France from him, and I got that little nod to the Mediterranean. So it very much influences my British Northern roots as well, yeah. And uh, very much is what I'm cooking now, yeah. 
Yeah. So you moved here in June, is that correct? Yeah, just before June. Yeah. yeah. So how have things been going here? Yeah, so far so good. Just, um, yeah, I mean, the team is uh, stable now. Um, and I've just started to put my food on the menu, really. Just start to put my stamp on it. I've started changing little things here and there. Um, but the most important thing was to get the team where it needs to be. And then now, now we're starting to make all our changes. Yeah. Yeah. So what does what is that change going to look like? Um, again, you know, seasonal. Um, I'm not. I'm not one of these people that puts twenty things on a plate. It's definitely not my style. Um, I like big bold flavors done properly. Yeah. That's how I would describe my food. I want grandma's cooking, flavor wise, with precision. And um, portion wise. Sorry. And portion wise. Yeah, we try to go not too big. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's tricky. To, there is a fine line between small and large. So yeah, it's uh, we just yeah. I think the balance is quite nice here because then the clientele that you get is quite varied. Yeah. Like you get a lot of city-based people, uh, predominantly in nighttime because it's a nightmare to come up in lunch. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and you get quite a few tourists as well, so you kind of get quite a wide uh, clientele. Yeah. That's really great. So, do you find that? that's an easy sort of audience to cater for. I expect that you would have had a different type of clientele at Bob Ricard, for example. Do you find, do you find that it's more suited to your style to cater to, to the people that dine here or? Um, kind of, I think, I think, I think it's tricky because they're quite similar in a sense that they're both destination restaurants. Yeah. I mean, Bob, Bob Ricard, you know, obviously they're very famous for the Wellington and uh, a lot of the theater with the desserts as well. Yeah. Uh, for here, obviously, you know, you come f- look at the view outside, it's amazing. So, it's you know, incredible. You, you come for the view, you come for the ambience, and obviously the food needs to deliver to a certain level as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's quite similar, actually. Yeah. Mm. Did you get people that came for the gimmick to, to Bob Bob Ricard, like for the champagne tap and for, exactly, the, for yeah. the glitz and glamour? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that was, uh, that was half the fun, really. You know, you just you, know, you never go there on a first date, otherwise it comes quite expensive. <laughs> you know, a cheeky little elbow, poof, you know. Um, <laughs> but it's, yeah, it was good fun. Yeah. That's great. And I, I know that the Wellington was famous there, but it's sort of French and Russian food. Mm-hmm. Did you take anything away from those sorts of influences as well? Um, again, I mean, I mean, pretty much, it, Bob Bob Ricard is, is one of them places, it, it's an institution, so, you know, it's not broke, so why fix it sort of thing, so all I did really was to cook that food uh, our way, and, um, you know, obviously Eric Chirol was there as well, so it was quite fun to see him again, Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, it, it was nice because we, you know, we were at different stages of my career as well, so to come back and see him there in a different space, everything became a lot easier. So when we decided to change any of the recipes, we tweaked them to our style. Yeah. But we didn't really change the menu, if that makes sense. That because makes it sense. kind of yeah. works. Yeah. Yeah. Do, do any dishes stand out for you in your memory that you were like, wow, that was that was a cracker. I'm going to remember that dish. Uh, a Bob Bob? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we did like a Veroniki. Mm-hmm. So it was like um, a baked potato, um, little raviolis. Uh, with loads of cheese through there, Lyonnaise of onions, so that's a big nod to the French uh, base. And then we made like almost like a vegetable chasseur sauce base and we finished it off with pickled mushrooms. So it was beautiful. Uh, it was really, you know, very sweet and sour, savoury. We had that lovely sweetness of the potato, the earthiness as well, because we used to dice up all the dried skin as well for it, so you that lovely little baked flavour. Um, it's one of them dishes, very simple, but... yeah. Wow, on flavour, you know. Sounds really like hearty and comforting and the yeah. kind of thing that you'd want in this weather. Well, it's just England, isn't it? Oh, yeah. year round. <laughs> <laughs> You're from Manchester, so yeah, that, exactly. is, that is absolutely <laughs> year round. Um, so, you, in terms of the menu here, you said that you've slowly appropriated the, the, the menu. Mm-hmm. What um, Can you name for me three dishes that are on the menu at the moment? Yeah. And the, what well, the ingredients that go into that dish and how you would use them in three separate dishes? Okay, so we've got um, a slow cooked egg on the menu. Mm-hmm. We've um, we've done like a burnt uh, leek emulsion, which is uh, basically like some uh, slow cooked eggs, and then you emulsify everything with your charred leek and some rapeseed oil. So it's a nod to Britain. Mm. Um, and we've got some lovely pickled uh, shimmyji mushrooms, almost like Greek style. Um, so it's quite fragrant uh, with some um, cooked salsa, uh, cooked uh, salsify, some. Um, 
crispy uh, parsnip crisps and a lovage oil. Uh, so okay. it's really quite, you know, just changing that season. So it's quite warm, you know, a little bit of pillow, pillow food, I like to call yeah. it. Um, that's one of our starters. The other one, we've got a lovely uh, roast uh, wood pigeon. Mm-hmm. I'm quite big on my shooting as well. So I've been shooting since a kid. Have you? Yeah. So, you know, shooting, fishing, uh, you know, I love it. Um, yeah, it's got a lovely little roast uh, wood pigeon breast with um, a little game terrine. So it's got some lovely venison through there, the, the pigeon leg meat, um, obviously pork fat, yeah. plenty of pork fat, <laughs> and bacon. Yeah. Um, and that's uh, just like a little tweed on the side. And we've got a lovely duck and beetroot uh, glass. So we had a really intense duck glass and finished it off with beetroot juice for freshness. Some little wilted blackberries and some endive as a little starter. Brilliant. So it's really, you know, very seasonal, Yeah. Uh, very me, um, with a little twist. It sounds like seasonality is something that matters a lot to you. Yeah, I mean, where where possible, <laughs> Britain doesn't help because the weather is a nightmare. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, I'll, for me, I think the king of seasons has got to be autumn, winter for Britain. I mean, you know, root vegetables, we are, you know, we champion it. Spring as well is great. Yeah. Quite a short season now. It's getting shorter and shorter. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, seasonality is one of the things that you need to be, you know, especially at a restaurant like this, you, you need to have that seasonality on your menu. You do? Yeah. And you were saying that you love game as well yeah big on game I mean I love it I mean it's you know my dad timed it perfectly I'm born on the second so it's the day after pheasant season <laughs> wow. October um, so you know <laughs> yeah he said to me I didn't want to do it on the first because we're shooting John so. <laughs> um, but yeah I mean we're going to I think we're going to put we put a little duck breast that's going to go on as well with some um, fermented uh, ispy cabbage and buttermilk so it's got a lovely sour flavour, but it's not quite sucrut. Mm. But it's just It's enough. on that fermented sort of note. Yeah, it's got that little sour note, but it can still take a, a char flavour, so we grill that. Um, and that's with a comfy glazed uh, duck leg. Um, a lovely little carrot puree, some fresh uh, sliced plums. And we've also cooked a baked celeriac with that, like a little wedge with bernoise and chicken stock. Um, and yeah, it's, it's delicious. It's, sounds you know, it's what I want to eat, you know. Yeah. It's, Your face is lighting up yeah, as it's going. exactly. Like I mean, and this is the thing. I think what I've tried to do slowly in every place I do is start to cook what I want to eat. Yeah. Because um, then, you know, you, you make it to the best of your ability. Um, and you're not cooking just for the sake of cooking. Of course. But it's more personal. Yeah. Um, you know, where I kind of, kind of throw my little grandma's bases here and there as well, you know. She's a great cook, so... She always says to me, I don't want to eat any of that a la carte crap, George. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so yeah, it's good fun. And, and what do you carry from your Cypriot roots? Is there anything that you you were saying you love olive oil? Yeah. Which is, of course, a, a, an obvious one. But is there anything from like Cypriot ingredients or techniques that you carry with you in, in your in your style of cooking? Because I know, I know in Cyprus there's a lot of marinated things, there's a lot of grilled stuff. But yeah. is there anything that that you, you particularly bring well, I mean, I mean, the beauty of Cyprus or any Mediterranean country is you have sunshine. So when you get a tomato, you don't have to do much to it. No, so when you make a salad, it's just oil. the drizzle of olive oil and a sprinkle of salt, a bit of lemon juice. Yeah. Um, but I mean, one thing that, I, that springs to mind, well, a couple actually with my grandma, she used to make a lovely rabbit stew, but it was all, it's almost like a sauce de yab. Yeah. Uh, so you've got a lovely Leonese, you know, inverted commas, she won't call it Elianese. <laughs> uh, it's cooked on the ends of uh, vinegar and uh, rabbit and chicken stock and everything slow braised and it's, it's delicious. Um, and also she does a lovely braised cuttlefish, which I used to do as well, um, with, uh, again, red wine vinegar, mm-hmm. olive oil, wh- uh, white wine, with some spiced uh, coriander seed, a little bit of cinnamon stick, clove, and she finishes off with chopped coriander. So I basically... One day I thought to myself, you know what, I want to recreate it. So I did that minced as a garnish. Um, and I just put a piece of fish on top and a few little jar, uh, charred uh, cow cotton onions. Boom. Uh, you know, but again, that depth of flavour was grandma, but I just brought that little finesse to it. It's brilliant. And it sounds like it ha- it is, it's a dish from that area, but it sounds like it could be French and it sounds like it adapts well to a British. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean you know, nowadays well. food is so... You know, I mean, for me, when, when, when you go to eat at a restaurant and you see the style of the food, I think it should be the style of the chef because when you look at the chef, then you understand the menu. Yeah. You know, you get it. Uh, yeah. But there's, uh, sometimes there is a bit of confusion, you know, there's a bit everywhere. 
Uh, but I, I like to use any sort of ingredients and even Asian influences as well. Uh, I do like to touch on a few Asian influences, but I wouldn't label the dish as an Asian dish, if that makes sense. Yeah, of course. I yeah. think there's there's quite a lot of that and people that are specialising in that field. So it's kind of one that you want to be aware of, but not necessarily throw yourself into if that's exactly. not your milieu. Um, so coming back to the ingredients from from Cyprus, is there anything that you, I know that you have to source as much as you can locally and seasonally, is there anything that you're like, no, I have to get that from maybe Cyprus or I need to get that from Southern Europe because it's just, it's just better? I mean, there's some, to be honest with you, I've never sourced them from Cyprus, but it's uh, one particular ingredient that's quite interesting is uh, brined caper leaves. Mm-hmm. Um, with the stalks so it's almost like a, a nettle okay um, it's really interesting ingredient um, and it brings a lovely acidity it's not something that's used very often but again you know if I was to that's something that I would probably actually think about bringing out <laughs> <laughs> yeah like gran can you bring it over <laughs> I loved it um, yeah. also olives you yeah know, they taste so different um, if I could I would import loads of ingredients from Cyprus um, halloumi yeah it's another one. Uh, it just tastes different because everything tastes different over there. Because really even the chickens, you know, the free range, they run. Like you see my grandma chasing one in the street. <laughs> um, even the oregano. Oh, for me, I think spice wise, there's two things I would definitely bring over. And one is wild oregano. Yeah. Uh, and also wild mint. Really interesting in flavour and totally different from what you'd get at a shop or from a supplier in England. Yeah. Really intense. Sounds lovely. Yeah. Um, so you here do a tasting menu and an a la carte menu. Mm-hmm. How difficult is it to manage both of those things at once? Um, it's not too bad, to be honest with you. I think, I mean, any kitchen is the same, but it's just down to organisation. So, you know, I've got a good team behind me. So they, you know, my senior staff understand what we're trying to deliver. And, you know, tasting menu, I think, for me, a tasting menu is an expression of you know the whole menu yeah. so it's basically your best bits yeah so it's what you want to deliver on really it's a special occasion thing uh whereas a la carte is a bit more you know bigger portions <laughs> whereas tasting these little snippets um but i think not really it's not really hard to manage i think it's just organization yeah yeah and if you were to choose would you prefer to have an a la carte menu or would you would you know if you knew that the audience was appropriate and that the clientele would accept it would you like to just have a tasting menu to be honest with you, I think my next career move after here would be to open something slightly smaller yeah. and just do a blackboard menu, like a tasting menu. Yeah. And just literally cook seasonally what's available, uh, but very much an expression of me on a plate. Yeah. Uh, so definitely tasting. Yeah. That was my next question. I was <laughs> going to say lots of chefs want to open their own restaurant. Not, not all chefs, but a lot of chefs do. And is that something that you would like? Yeah, I'd love to. I mean, I think half half the battle in opening anything is having the right partner. Yeah. Um, but I think, yeah, I would definitely love to open almost like a little bistro. Mm-hmm. But, you know, just proper food and, you know, done well. Yeah. yeah would you go back up to Manchester or would you do it here? If the opportunity... You know what? I always said to myself I wouldn't go back because I was like, you know what, never again. I've left. I've done it, you know. But if the opportunity came... I would love to go back to do it there because, you know, I mean, to be able to go back up north and, you know, put my stamp on the city yeah. after, you know, travelling in London, it'd be amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was brilliant for Manchester, to, uh, the news last week that they got a Michelin star for, for Manor. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a nice little buzz. I think it's, um, I think it's healthy and I think it's something that, you know, I mean, again, you know, getting a Michelin star for your food is you know, always going to be a chef's, you know, dream. Yeah. Um, and I think it's a nice way to start Manchester and hopefully it kicks off a bit of a buzz and a bit of competition in a nice healthy way because um, you know chefs all love competition they do um, and yeah I think it'd be, it'd be amazing to have the opportunity to go back it'd be amazing to put my stamp on it yeah and so obviously you're here now what is your plan for the near future and how how do you want to further put your stamp on on the menu here I mean, for me, I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm, I think, like I said earlier, the main thing is to get that seasonality on the plate and just ultimately deliver 
and just tone in on my style really I mean it's it's quite a nice place because you, you kind of have a, a carte or blanche to yeah you know to write your menu um, and it's quite nice to see feedback from the clientele that we get yeah. because we have like a rest diary so you know they're very on it with their emails you know which is great yeah because uh, even for positive negatives I was gonna say fix. yeah but it's good because yeah. it is you know it's it's honest to a certain extent you know maybe it is maybe it isn't you don't know but either way it's feedback and I think it's it's really important to take that on board to develop not only the food but your style because yeah. if it's something that doesn't agree with the clientele that you got then obviously you have to change it yeah you know it's what they want at the end of the day so but everyone very much is an individual so you know it's it's not easy cooking for individuals, but I think the most important thing is to stick to my style yeah. and just develop that here and, you know, hopefully they get it so far so good. Great. Yeah. Well, best of luck anyway. It looks it looks great and I'm excited to um, have a look at your, your dishes in a minute. Amazing. Can't wait. Thanks a lot, George. Cheers. Lovely. We hope you enjoyed this interview and if you have any comments, feel free to tweet us or comment on the post. Uh, we're making all of our interviews available to download. And finally, if you like what we do, whether it's our podcast or our videos or even our features, please head over to our Patreon page and support us there.